Good evening and thank you for joining us. Ontario has made the unprecedented decision to declare a state of emergency amid the ongoing protests and blockades in several cities, including Ottawa and Windsor. Premier Doug Ford saying that it's no longer just a protest and it's time for demonstrators to go. Colin DeMello reports. Faced with a drawn-out occupation and increasing economic disruption, Ontario Premier Doug Ford denounced the demonstration in the strongest of terms. I call it a siege because that's what it is. It's an illegal occupation. There will be consequences for these actions, and they will be severe. To get the situation under control, Premier Ford is enacting a state of emergency province-wide, aiming to secure airports, rail lines, bridges and border crossings, and the 400 series highways. It will also include protecting the safe and essential movement of ambulatory and medical services, public transit, municipal and provincial roadways, as well as pedestrian walkways. Police will now have the power to lay fines of up to $100,000. Occupiers could face up to a year in jail, and the personal and professional licenses of drivers caught up in the demonstrations could be seized. It's unclear, however, whether police will have the power to forcibly remove people to dismantle the blockades. The government suggests there could be more to come. The initial declaration will be for 42 hours. Um, the cabinet will be meeting uh, tomorrow to go over further um, ad amendments. The Ford government has been under pressure to ramp up the provincial response to the protest for days now. Critics have been suggesting many of the measures that the government ended up implementing today. Those same critics say the premier should take a zero tolerance approach. As immediately as possible, the government needs to move on this. The Premier is also facing questions of why it took the Ontario government two weeks to act. Ford suggested he wanted to see a peaceful resolution first. We have tried and tried and tried. The occupiers in Ottawa, they are not listening. The trade problems that we would see if we didn't clear the Ambassador Bridge would be unprecedented. But during the height of some of the protests in Ottawa, when the city declared a state of emergency, Ford was spotted in cottage country on a snowmobile trail over the weekend. I was at the cottage. I went out on my snowmobile. I take calls till 1 o'clock in the morning. I get calls before 6 o'clock in the morning. And I will not stop until we get this taken care of. Now, critics are calling on the Premier to focus his full attention on the situation in Ottawa and Windsor, asking for a quick resolution. And if we don't see movement in this regard, like, right away, they need to step it up. The Premier would not say what's next if the current plan falls short. That was CTV's Colin DeMello, and we'll have more on those blockades and demonstrations a little later on in the news hour. After weeks of accusations, human rights complaints and mystery surrounding the Thunder Bay Police Service and its oversight board, the Ontario Civilian Police Commission has officially launched an investigation into the local police force. And new details have come to light that it was the board that first asked the OCPC last April to probe the actions of Chief Sylvie Hoth and Deputy Chief Ryan Hughes, who was abrupt, abruptly suspended last month. Jonathan Wilson explains. According to the media release, the OCPC has concerns about the police force's management of discipline, the conduct of criminal investigations of its officers, and the ability of senior leadership to handle the day-to-day -day police operations in good faith. Last month, it was revealed the Solicitor General asked the Commission to launch a probe based on numerous human rights complaints filed against the force, including by Police Board member George Ann Morriso. But the information released today shows the Police Board had its own concerns about how Morriso was treated. The terms of reference detail allegations that Deputy Chief Ryan Hughes initiated a criminal probe against Morriso and had her cell phone searched, all without the Chief's knowledge. And the board alleges Hoth failed to take appropriate steps to address Hughes's actions and provided misinformation to the board about it. Finally, it's alleged that Hughes, who was suspended on January 28th pending an internal investigation, police lawyer Holly Walborn and Chief Hoth colluded in their responses to the OCPC's initial inquiries into the situation. The Commission says if the claims are proven, it may amount to serious misconduct and, in the case of Hoth, may constitute a failure to perform the duties as chief. 
Police Board Chair Kristen Oliver says the board welcomes the OCPC's decision to investigate. Is... Lawyer Chantel Bryson, who filed nine human rights complaints against the force and or the board in recent months, tweeted that the OCPC failed to consult with her before announcing its probe and says she was unaware of the separate complaints which led to this investigation. Jonathan Wilson, TBT News. Turning to COVID-19 now, two more people in the Thunder Bay District have died from the virus and there have now been 77 deaths during the pandemic. And despite declining hospital numbers across the province, that's still not the case at the Regional Health Sciences Centre. Hospital officials say while non-emergency surgeries are now allowed to proceed, those will have to ramp up slowly due to the persistent high case count. The number of COVID-19 patients at the regional is unchanged today. 47 patients remain in hospital with nine still in intensive care. Hospital occupancy has dipped slightly since Thursday. It's now at just under 102 percent and the ICU occupancy rate remains at nearly 91 percent. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting 192 new cases since its last update on Wednesday. There are now 359 active cases, up from 310. And there are 50 people in hospital across the TBDHU catchment area, with 10 in the ICU. In the Northwestern Health Unit, there are now 316 active cases, 68 more than there were on Wednesday. More than 53% of those infections, 168, are in the Sioux Lookout area. And the NWHU's seven-day test positivity rate has risen to 20.7%. It's no surprise that the pandemic had a significant impact on the tourism industry in 2021, but Canadians were on the move domestically last year, and Thunder Bay was a fairly popular attraction. The Wake the Giant Music Festival and the Dirt Track Nationals stock car races were among the few major spectator events held, but they each brought in thousands of people, including many from out of town. The virus continued to impact air travel, which was down 60% compared to a normal year. Closed borders kept most American visitors away. They usually make up nearly a third of local tourists. But Thunder Bay tourism manager Paul Pepe says hotel stays indicate the city was ahead of the curve in terms of pandemic recovery. We still outpaced most of Canada in recovery, and so our hotel occupancy rate uh, at the end of the year was 59%, and the Canadian average was just a little under 42%. So you know we were, uh, um, you know, still one of the faster recovering markets in in the country. Um, and uh, even though the travel season was short, uh, we saw Canadians were getting out and hitting the road in July and August and September in big numbers. And Pepe believes the city will see a bounce back this year, and he hopes that turnaround will come from sports, tourism, and conventions. A local business that produces foam insulation from recycled materials has officially received certification for its products. Officials with Eco Carbon Foam and Oliver Papoonj say that finally opens up a number of doors for the company after what's been a difficult journey to get to this point. Basilios Bellows reports. The certification for EcoCarbon Foam is a huge step, allowing them to sell their products anywhere in North America. The process of producing the environmentally friendly insulation is unique to the company, with manufacturing a non-ozone depleting process. The business was started by Elena Rogalski and her husband Victor, and they have faced challenges along the way. Production issues, the pandemic, and a devastating fire at this former sawmill building, all difficulties the Rogalskis had to endure but it makes the certification all the more rewarding. So for six months we were without any power here in completely dark building uh, with uh, damaged equipment, with uh, wires that had to be redone. So it was also a little bit crazy, <laughs> but um, we figured it out. Everything worked out, a little bit patience, a little bit endurance. Ecocarbon Foam is now able to sell their insulation to places such as supply stores, home builders, and renovators. The increased production also means more jobs for the area. The company that currently employs four individuals is expecting a jump to 30 employees after year one, with more increases beyond. They also have other plans including looking to explore recycling partnerships within Thunder Bay to acquire materials. Spokesperson Jason Broussard says the certification approval lets the community and potential business partners know the high quality of their products. 
really allows us to expand our overall production uh, and sales opportunities uh, to a much larger audience. Uh, um, it provides customers with the confidence knowing that they're getting a product that is uh, meeting or exceeding all the industry standards for safety as well as performance. The certification is a massive step for EcoCarbon Foam, who now look to expand their business across Ontario and beyond. Vasilios Bellows, TVT News. Long-term care capacity is about to be expanded in several communities across the Northwest. An announcement from the province today paves the way for a total of 55 new beds in Atacokan, Marathon and Manitowage. The announcement came as a welcome surprise for the CEO of the Atacokan General Hospital, which is on the receiving end of 22 new LTC beds. Adam Riley has that story. You're either going to stay in the hospital, even though you're actually more, more applicable for a long-term care bed, or you're going to be staying home and trying to get services at home. That is what life is like for people on wait lists looking for access to long-term care in smaller communities across the Northwest. But that is about to change for residents in Manitowoc, Marathon and Atacokan. The province has now greenlit construction projects to bring a combined total of 55 new long-term care beds in those three communities. Ontario's Minister of Long-Term Care, Paul Calandra, says those beds, along with 73 other new and 100 upgraded beds located elsewhere in northern Ontario, are part of a $6.4 billion commitment. And this is an unprecedented bill. The investment will lead to over 30,000 net new beds and about 28,000 upgraded long-term care beds across the province. This is the largest build building program and investment in long-term care in Canadian history. Sante Manitowoc Health will see an expansion of 18 new beds, bringing the total there to 27. And Marathon will see the construction of a new long-term care wing at the Wilson Memorial Hospital to accommodate 14 new beds. The announcement is being welcomed by Atacokan General Hospital CEO George Van Slyke. Her facility currently has 26 long-term care beds that run at nearly full capacity. And the senior population in Atacokan is expected to grow by 10.8% over the next eight years. There are a few details as to what the 22-bed expansion will look like, but Van Slyke has an idea as to how it will be integrated into the hospital. The general idea right now is there's a space in front of our rehab department, which is currently the staff parking lot. So there's an opportunity to build there because then it's going to be a logical connection to the existing long-term care, and then we'll go from there. All three projects are expected to begin construction in the spring of 2023. Adam Riley, TBT News. Transportation Safety Board investigators are pointing to a dislodged retainer ring as the likely cause of a helicopter crash near Nipigon last June. The water bucket helicopter was returning from a firefighting mission to the MNR fire base in Nipigon when it experienced a sudden loss of tail rotor thrust and control. The pilot issued a mayday call and was forced to attempt to land in the bush. He suffered serious injuries but has now fully recovered. The helicopter had recently been reassembled upon returning to Canada after operating overseas. The TSB's final report states that for whatever reason, a retainer ring wasn't sitting properly, ultimately causing the tail rotor to fail. The agency suggests using a mirror to inspect retainer rings and helicopter tail sections, as they can often be difficult to see during assembly and safety checks. A Thunder Bay man is currently on top of the leaderboard in a nationwide fundraiser for the Canadian Cancer Society. Tom Boland decided to take part in the Dry February Challenge after a number of his family members battled cancer in recent years. Participants go alcohol-free during the month of February to raise money for cancer research. Boland originally started with a goal of $1,000, but thanks to overwhelming support from friends and strangers alike, He's been able to soar past that target in less than two weeks. More than $18,000 has poured in so far. Boland is surprised to find himself in first place with more than 26,000 participants across Canada. He says he's very grateful and thankful for all of the community support he's received thus far. That's a lot of money um, and it just this is again a testament to the people in Thunder Bay and it also speaks to me to say that there are so many families that are dealing with the uh, you know, the horrific challenges that this insidious disease brings upon us. Anyone who wants to donate to Boland or wants to find out more about the challenge can visit the website dryfeb.ca. 
A Satchego Lake First Nation man is now a millionaire after taking home a $1 million Lotto Max Max Millions prize. Dean Beardy's windfall comes from the December 7th draw. The 58-year-old grandfather says he almost cried when he found out he'd won and had to convince himself that it was real. Beardy says he celebrated with his parents over tea and cookies. He now plans to build a chapel in Satchego Lake, which is located about 425 kilometers north of Sioux Lookout. Well, if you missed any of today's local stories or you'd like to see them again, you can find them on tvnewswatch.com. You can also follow us on social media. Facebook users can find TBT News at TBT News T Bay and on Twitter. We can be found at TBT News underscore T Bay. Well, Fiona, a lot of snow overnight.